So uh, I'm Langdon uh, White, uh, who probably many of you know. Um, and uh, what we decided to do for this talk, um, even though it's listed as just Ralph, um, we're actually going to do, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of future stuff, and then Ralph's going to talk about building this stuff. Oh, wait, I have a slide for this. Um, I also can't find my mouse. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I'm Langdon, and I tried to find embarrassing photos, but um, these are the best I could do. So uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the future and the why of what we're doing. Uh, and then Ralph's going to talk about the how of what we're doing. Um, and then Adam is going to talk about the with what kind of what, of what we're doing. Uh, so with that incredibly detailed introduction, I'm going to move on. Good. All right. So kind of I'm going to talk a little bit about like kind of here's what we're doing kind of right now in the future, right? And then we'll get a little further and further afield. So we're targeting uh, kind of an MVP of Fedora Server uh, for F27. What does MVP mean? I was getting there. <laughs> um, so, uh, so basically what we worked with the server work. Masochistic worked. villainous plan. Yes, that's it. Um, so, uh, and just for the audience, uh, MVP stands for masochistic villainous plan per Ian McLeod. Um, so what we did was worked with server working group and said, what do you consider uh, the kind of most important set of things uh, that would make Fedora server. And then let's modularize those and then deliver that as the Fedora server. This comes from the startup world as a minimum viable product. So not the bare minimum that you could build, but not everything you want to build. It's something that people could actually find useful. So that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing is workstation. We haven't really gone too far into workstation. Um, you know, they are currently already working with us about trying to marry modules and flat packs and trying to figure out how that's going to work together. Uh, we also have an interesting go discussion going on in the mailing list about overlap between module metadata and app stream metadata and how can we marry those things together. Um, but that's kind of a, you know, we, we need to get to that. We're not quite ready for what we want to do with Workstation. Um, Atomic, however, has already, I think, successfully built the uh, first version of a modularized Atomic. Um, and so the idea with Atomic is that because Atomic is a very, uh, like a very well-known set of things that make up that kind of base OS tree, um, it's kind of simpler than all the rest of Fedora uh, because we know exactly what goes in that box. Um, so the Atomic, and they also want to be able to use the module kind of infrastructure to allow for some of the CI uh, improvements that we want to see in Fedora. So we can use the module kind of definitions to allow for things like gating. So that's kind of why uh, the Atomic um, Working Group has been working with that. And so we hope maybe we'll have something for F27, although they may do a slightly different release schedule because it's Atomic. So there's that. Um, and I would like to point out my even bigger than Duplos Legos. Um, one of the things that uh, we like to talk about with modules is like kind of how it makes things simpler, uh, particularly when you talk about containers. Uh, so as you can see here, right, we, we have, you know, your typical Docker file, although pretty lightweight one. Um, but what this lets us do is we can, because we have these kind of this stream concept, we only have to kind of update one file and then we can kind of rebuild the container and we get to new and uh, different versions of those containers more easily. And I had a better segue to this slide earlier today, um, but I don't remember what that was. So, sorry, it's a little out of context. Um, but if you notice down in the bottom, that's the nodejs.module file. You can just change that stream there to be six or whatever, or 10, which is probably more likely, and then just kind of rebuild your module, or rebuild your container, and uh, it just works. You don't have to change anything in the container about, uh, you know, to deal with the fact that now you have to change all the different uh, RPMs that you want to solve. So that's one of the things that makes it a little easier, which I think is cool. So this is kind of what we want to do uh, for the tooling um, and to make it so that modules have as little impact as humanly possible on um, kind of the RPM workflow. Um, and apparently, even though it's seven minutes before the time for this uh, talk, there was like hardly anybody in here. We were going to try to negotiate for grand. So, but yeah. So sorry, there's no seats. Um, so, but the idea is that we want to be allow. We want to allow like a packager or whatever to uh, essentially just give a single input. Here's the SRPM I care about, and then kind of have everything else just generated, um, so that it can kind of you know. So it's a very easy workflow um, 
for the first time, maybe you have to touch it, clean it up a little bit more, uh, but then as much as it can be is that, you know, over time it just happens, right? You don't really have to be involved. Um, so that's kind of the generating from SRPMs. You know, a general goal I have is that the, the human editable part of the module MD file is, you know, like I would like it to be like four lines, you know, if that. Uh, another thing that uh, we discovered doing the Boltron activity was that it's important sometimes to be able to view the kind of whole ecosystem to see how the different pieces fit together. Um, that's not that important for an individual packager, but it's important when you want to do something new. So you can kind of say, okay, what's kind of available and out there, and where would my thing fit into the overall ecosystem? So uh, Adam's been primarily working on that. Oh, and I was going to comment on this. We actually have implementations of a lot of these, but we have like three or four where individuals kind of said, you know what, this is really a pain. I'm going to go write a little tool to make this easier and faster. And now we're in the process of kind of merging all those to actually end up with like a good tool for each of these kind of spaces. But we wanted to allow kind of everybody just to see what pain points they ran into and then, you know, and then kind of consolidate after the fact. Uh, the next thing is uh, a kind of in that same ecosystem problem. Um, we need some tools that validate kind of across the ecosystem to ensure that all the modules are not overlapping and that they're working together and that they're continuing to stay updated and that kind of stuff. Uh, we have some of these as well. So it's kind of like we need almost like repo closure kind of for the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, so it's similar to like a repo closure problem. Um, and then the last thing is the copper team already has in their development environment. Uh, you know, a way to build modules and uh, use them, but they're a little blocked on the kind of initial content from both us and the platform team to be able to ship that. Uh, so we really want that to come online so, um, so that you have kind of a good place to test because in the modular world, we're probably not gonna do something like scratch builds. Instead, we're gonna probably do stuff that's more like in copper and then you kind of promote it uh, into uh, the real, you know, the real infrastructure. But then because we're introducing all this gating stuff, that doesn't necessarily mean it will actually get released. It actually has to pass the tests and stuff first. This is some stuff we're still working out, like how, how should this work? Um, but one of the things that I think people find confusing is that there is not a scratch build. Excuse me. Um, and so just be aware that that's you know, kind of intentional, maybe not long-term intentional, but right now it's intentional and that's why it's not there. Um, the other thing is, so, you know, some people want to work on stuff, you know, that's out in the infrastructure using something like copper, but some people want to have just a local build possibility. So we've also been working on a, a Vagrant image that will kind of have all the stuff installed and, you know, all that stuff that you need to build modules um, just kind of right there already all set up so that it makes your life a little easier. Um, and then the nice thing about doing it kind of with Vagrant is that it's pretty easy for us to extrapolate into an Ansible playbook or even you just cop copying and pasting the shell script, right? So you could actually set up a local machine. But that's why we're starting with, with a Vagrant box so you can kind of get an idea, just, you know, plug and play and it just works. Any questions so far? All right. Not saying anything too controversial today. <laughs> so here's what we need, right? We need help. Um, we need, uh, now we have a process in place now that you can create your own modules. We would like you to create your own modules. Um, and there is a workshop later in this session where you can uh, first learn about how to do that. Tomas sitting in the back will be running that. Um, after that, there's one about building tests for modules um, as well. Um, that's, uh, Petter will be doing that one, but I don't see him. Um, so he is apparently somewhere else. Um, then we kind of have this kind of list of issues that we've been working on that are on the on the actual modularity kind of project <laughs> itself. Um, the review process, that second bullet down, we're going to, at the end, we'll kind of have a takeaway slide, so don't worry about it too much. Um, and then, uh, you know, all the documents about how to build modules are on, on the third URL. Um, and then where we've been putting them, so what I was kind of saying is like, we have this human editable component and so we've been doing that right now in GitHub. Um, now that uh, Pagger is on Diskit, we might want to switch, but I'm not sure we're ready to do that yet. Uh, like we just don't have time between now and F27. But that kind of human entered stuff we've been storing on uh, GitHub, and then we generate out the stuff that we put into Diskit, which is kind of the more complete module NDs or whatever. All right, I could probably be hitting space bars. 
So looking ahead, let's see, how am I doing on time? Good. You're good. Four minutes. Um, <laughs> all right, so looking ahead, one of the big challenges we've been running into, and we knew we were going to run into this, is many, many um, packages kind of kind of packaged together things, uh, too many things. And it seems logical from when you look at it from an RPM-based distribution. So Image Magic is everyone's uh, favorite friend right now. Um, <laughs> but there, it's a really good example of this, which is that Image Magic has a library, which could be, <coughs> which you may have multiple versions of. But because in the same RPM is the convert command line executable, you can't have two of them, right? Because they, they would conflict on the convert. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, and if you came to Adam's talk the other day about documentation, we have similar problems with docs, is that you know if they're bundled in there, then it's hard to allow for divergence, right? Um, you know, unit tests are my pet peeve around this. You know, it's like we have to build all these things that we may not actually use, um, you know, kind of in the deployment side of the house. So I think as we move more modular, we're going to want to see more repackaging. And so that repackaging, we may find automated ways to do that. We may ask people to repackage things. We may decide, you know what, for these 37 different things, we just don't care. You know, so I think we'll see over time, but that's why this is the future slide. It's like, this is one of the problem areas, and I think it's something we're going to have to deal with. Um, you know, whichever way we decide to deal with it. Um, the next thing is dynamic linking. So one of the big things that we have in modularity, we have parallel availability, but we don't do a good job of parallel installability at this point. My original thinking around this was to actually make the kind of OS, um, you know, basically the thing that is loading all these libraries for you to be smarter about which libraries it's loading. So that you know any given application, when it was installed, it would actually say, oh yeah, I want this version of that library and that version of that library and that thing over there. Um, and that it could then just handle uh, where they were coming from and making sure that you got the right stuff when you asked for it. Um, that is probably a bunch of work. It's also a ton of repackaging because basically it relies on things like our pathing, which is you know disallowed per FBC policy right now. Um, so that's a ton of work. However, the, tr the thing we have going on right now is, and I'm just using the term native containers because there's like a bunch of competing technical implementations to this. But basically what I mean is containers that feel like they're part of the operating system rather than kind of feeling like they're out over there. And so you have system containers doing this. Flatpak kind of does this. I'm sure there are others I don't know about or somebody is working on in their backyard. Um, but that also solves the same problem of how do we get parallel installation. And if the, the container folks do an even better job of making that feel more and more native, that might just be the answer, and an easy answer, which doesn't require tons of repackaging and a new way of doing things and everything else. And we, so we might be able to just rely on containers. So this is, again, why it's kind of a future statement. Good. So, and, but my guess is we'll actually end up with a blend of both. Right? Is that you know for some things it's going to make a lot more sense to uh, have that all native to the OS and you know we we do do parallel installation of some kind for some weird reason of certain kinds of things and then like all the other things do it with these native containers whatever they end up fully looking like my bet is it'll be something like the system containers effort um, which is pretty good we just need to move all the things so that they can actually run that way um, all right so the next thing is um, and one of the things that makes doing the future talk of this talk hard is, you know, modularity is really meant to be like an enablement for innovation. So I think there's going to be a lot of things we can do with kind of very flexible metadata that we, can, we can't do now. The thing is, I don't know what that stuff is, right? Like, we kind of need it to, like, land, and then we need people to start playing around with it and say, oh, you know, it would be really useful if we knew this thing or that thing about this particular application. Um, and it would be nice if we could compare them in this kind of way and that kind of way. So, you know, I think a lot of what we're going to do next comes out of having this kind of much more flexible framework that we can now start to play with. And I'm hoping that, you know, people in this room and people elsewhere are going to come up with whatever our next innovation is. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just us, right? It's, you know, we're just trying to set up this environment and we want everybody to play, right? 
So I think that was my last slide. Thank you. Yes, sir. Would you consider any or all of those things a continuation of modularity? Or are they things we're going to do in the broader to our ecosystem now that modularity is in place? Right. Is yeah. It's, it's much more. Is that a meaningful question? Yeah. So, uh, so the question is kind of like, um, are these projects of modularity or are they projects of Fedora, right? And in some ways, I half jokingly, half seriously say, modularity is done. You know, like, like we pretty much feel like we've solved all the questions. Um, you know, there's a couple still that we would like to really get cleaner and tighten up a little bit. Um, there's things like tooling. You know, it's, we can't just walk away and say, you know, hey, you know, you're on your own for tooling or any of that stuff. So we have a bunch of stuff we still have to do. But this stuff, yes, it's exactly that. What we're trying to do is we try to enable a flexible environment. We're going to get to it. You know, we're, the train's moving. Um, but then, you know, yeah, like the, the experimentation is a Fedora-wide experimentation. Um, and we need to, you know, we need to enable everybody to participate in that innovation. And we don't want, you know, I certainly don't want the modularity team to be responsible for trying to figure out what that innovation is. It's just, you know, it's not enough people. We want to, you know, we need everybody, right? Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Thank you for the right answer. <laughs> I guess. I uh, that was my last slide. So, um, and uh, I thought I'd do a little throwback for everybody. Nice. Um, <laughs> so, does, uh, does anybody, anybody have any questions specifically for me? We're also going to do some more questions at the end. But you mentioned tooling to detect if like modules are overlapping their package sets. Is there going to be some centralized authority that decides how packages get divided up into modules, or is it going to be wide open? I don't know. Um, that's a policy yes. question. Um, I mean, it's a policy question. I think we're going to have to, um, you know, we have the exact same problem with RPMs today, right? Is, you know, who, who and how do we decide whether or not this thing should be included in, you know, this block or that block? Um, so I think we're going to continue to have that problem. I, I foresee the mod, well, and actually um, the council actually said um, the modularity working group in some ways will morph into something like the FPC in the sense of try to be the centralized authority of here's how you write modules, here's how you, you know, keeping track of those guidelines, updating processes, um, and maybe making those kinds of decisions. Maybe those decisions go to FESCO. I think a little bit it's going to be we have to kind of see the problems we run into before we can kind of come up with the answers. Um, but yeah, it is definitely a potential issue. Um, cool. Do you want to use mine, or you want to? Okay. If it loaded, I'll use yours. Oh yeah, yeah, it did. Cool. I just need to learn how to use a computer. But uh, yeah. yeah, they're hard. Whose idea was this computer thing? Much easier when there's none of that graphic stuff. Right? <laughs> we never need that anyway. Whose idea that was? Oh, good. I think mine. I don't trust you. It's probably smart. It works. Right? No, no, no. Full screen? No, no, no. Oh, there we go. Hey, cool. Hi, everybody. I'm Ralph. Oh, I is the microphone not on? I'll just talk loud. Correct. Okay. Hey, Ralph. Uh, hi. <laughs> the module hold service, and so can you. So, so um, I was introduced broadly as talking about the how we're going to do this stuff, but it's a little bit more narrow scope than that because the how includes other services that are beyond just how models are put together themselves. There's the automation uh, and orchestration framework that Jan Kaluja presented on called Freshmaker that plays a, a, a bigger kind of governing uh, role in, in the build system. Uh, but I'm just going to talk specifically about the part that's responsible for putting together modules themselves uh, here. And so there were three things I wanted to cover. I wanted to compare with last year to today what has changed in the module build service. We presented it at Flock uh, a year ago, and some things changed. We'll talk about those. Uh, a review of the MBS internals and how does it work and how you could help to make it better. The point there being, kind of like in Langan's pitch, uh, mm -hmm. my team has been working almost exclusively on the module build service, but we would like more people to be involved in that. So it's a community-owned tool that's a part of our process, right? There's bandwidth issues with small groups of people having you know, the, the intimate knowledge about how something works, and we need everybody to be able to fix it, patch it, fix bugs, make RFEs, and so on. Uh, and lastly, if I have time, I'll get into missing features that we know we don't have right now, but that we're going to be introducing in short time. Uh, and if you want to get involved, that would be a place to help uh, in coding on the MDS. 
Uh, so on how to build modules, uh, nothing has really fundamentally changed since last year when we presented at Flock, but there are a couple of things. Uh, a couple of new backends were grown, uh, some efficiency improvements and changes like that. I only want to focus in detail on the last two uh, on these slides, on this slide, um, which I'll show, show here. The first is that we introduced this notion of build order groups uh, in a module. When you're building um, uh, a module, what's my initial sentence here? Yeah, back up. The way that we uh, were building modules last year, imagine that you had a module with 400 RPMs in it. Uh, the module build service would submit the build of the first RPM to Koji, uh, and then it would wait it to com for it to complete, and then it would wait for the repo to be regenerated so that, that that RPM would be available in the build route of the next RPM. Then it would build that RPM, and wait for a repo regen, wait for that to finish, then start the third one, and so on. And so this took an insanely long uh, amount of time to do. Our theory was that we had to do that um, because any one of the modules, excuse me, any one of the RPMs in the module might affect the build route uh, of another one, so we couldn't just you know, do them all. What if they depended on each other? So we did the naive thing, and that's, that's how it worked then. We introduced this notion of a build order group, uh, which is a way for the module maintainer, the packager, uh, to specify uh, groups of RPMs that can be built in parallel, and only once they're all done, they get tagged into the build route for the next build order batch to start. So you have control of, as the packager over how the MBS actually executes the order uh, of the RPMs in your module. Uh, so here's an example uh, of a hypothetical module. I think I sh stole this from the shared user space module that was a part of the F26 Boltron uh, release, which is going away in F27, but here's some, here's some RPMs. There were many more in the real module. It's a limited set. Uh, you might have in group one, Chirpath and Libdwarf. Those two get submitted in parallel, and one might finish quick, the other one takes a longer time, but only once the last one is done do we then do a repo regen and, and build the next set. Uh, submit parallel builds of Dyn and, and SQLite Devel, and then same thing repeats. When they're done, we, repo, uh, we regenerate the repo and then can build the last RPM in the third group. Uh, reusing components is a second feature that was introduced since last uh, flock. Before, again, we weren't, we had no way to know um, what in the build route was affecting anything else. So if anything changed, we felt in order to be safe, we have to rebuild every one of the RPMs from source. If you had a module with 400 RPMs, that meant 400 rebuilds anytime one spec file in that 400 would change which is dramatically inefficient, right? We, we, we knew that couldn't, couldn't stay. Um, so we came up with some rules for when we get to reuse components from a previous module build. Um, obviously, if the spec file changed, we have to rebuild that one. But of all the other ones, how do we make decisions about what to reuse? And so here in the center, you, you don't have to read them, so I'll talk about them in the future slides, are, are three um, rules that we came up with for our, our reuse logic. Uh, it leverages the build order groups that I talked about in the, in the previous section. Uh, and so here, consider the example where the system tap spec file changes. Uh, if you submit a module build of this hypothetical module, and the system tap spec file had changed since the last build, the system tap RPM will be rebuilt. But all of the other RPMs will be reused from the previous uh, module build. They'll be tagged from the old tag into the new tag for your module build. Uh, and so this is like the optimal case. One thing changed, one thing was rebuilt, and nothing is, is wasted. Yeah. So is it doesn't, wouldn't like the dependency graph provide you with the information of uh, uh, which things? It's in my last slide. So this is, this is our current state of okay. reuse logic, and the, the research project is how do we get that information out to have even more intelligent uh, rebuilds. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then part of the problem is that RPM the spec files aren't parsable, right? They kind of have to be executed in a context. So what does the real build require? So you don't know until you've already started to build it. Yep. So I need RPM scientists. Uh, to <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Um, so that was the first case, the nice case. Here's a, here's a slightly worse case where let's say the Dyn inst spec file changed. You submit a build of this module, or and, and this is in, in like Jan Kaluja's talk, with Freshmaker, the, the automated system will be submitting builds of this module. Um, but the module build service, once it receives this request to build the larger module, uh, it will look and see that Dyn inst changed. And so because it knows that SQLite Devel and Dyn inst are in the same build order group, it will reuse one because it's it, it, the Dynance wasn't present in the build route the last time it was built, uh, so it can just be reused. Dynance has to be rebuilt because it changed, but then everything in group three then gets rebuilt from source because something new is influencing its build route that wasn't there the last time around. And then here's the here's the worst case: if the trip path uh, spec file changes, it gets rebuilt. The other things in its build order group get reused, but then all of the subsequent build order groups uh, get rebuilt from source. And that's the current state of things. Uh, so a review of MBS internals. I'll check my time real quick. Um, I'm running short. The uh, MBS internals, uh, the per point here is to get an idea of how things are organized in the MBS source code so that you can get into it and have some bearings to help patch and change things. 
Uh, so there's two major processes. There's a web front end uh, and a back end scheduler. Uh, the web front end receives requests from users or from other automated systems like FreshMaker saying, I, wanna, I want you to build this particular module, and it doesn't do very much. It does some validation on the, the module MD file to make sure it's sane. Uh, in the module MD file are listed uh, uh, RPM spec files that should be pulled in as part of the module and, and uh, diskit branches. Uh, so the MBS will validate that and go and check diskit to make sure those branches exist and it will record the refs uh, at that particular point in time so we know exactly what was built uh, in this round of the module. Uh, it then announces a message that's picked up by the back end that says you know, to start actually doing work on building this module. Uh, as modules are built, they pass through a variety of states. Uh, here's a diagram to kind of skip over, but if you want to know the, the details, come back and, and, and look at it. Things move from init to wait to build, and then build takes a very long time. And at the end, there's a done and a ready state that uh, denotes uh, things are ready to be composed. Uh, the building steps in Koji, uh, so that's that, that center state, the build state that takes a long amount of time. The bulk of that work is the, the process of going through those build order groups like I described in a previous slide. But note that two things happen at the very beginning of that process that are worth being aware of. Uh, the first is that the MBS um, creates uh, the tags in Koji that are going to contain the RPM to this module creates a build tag and like a, like a distribution tag where the, the content um, that you're outputting ultimately gets tagged into. Um, and importantly, the build tag, though, uh, uses Koji tag inheritance uh, and, and sets up the relationships based on the build requires that you specify in your module MD. Say we're building an HTTPD 2.4 module, uh, that might depend at build time on the platform module, and so the platform 27 tag that was produced by another module build at some other point in time uh, is brought in through Koji tag inheritance so that all of its RPMs are available at build time, even though those, those don't get like rolled into the output of your HTTP 2.4 module. Cool? Cool. For, for the curious, uh, what we do with the build groups in Koji, which define what things get installed by default, uh, are specified in terms of the uh, install profiles of the modules. So we reuse that feature for client-side use about you know whether you want to be in a server profile or a client profile and to build an SRPM build profiles that determine behavior at build time. Uh, the code in the back end is organized something like this. Uh, there is a, a central consumer that receives messages from the message bus, uh, and it passes off those messages to a variety of handlers that are a part of the code. Each of those handlers corresponds with a type of event that it should be responsible for handling. Uh, a modules <laughs> handler, for instance, uh, might respond to events from the MBS web that says, you know, Ian has requested a module build uh, and it has entered the, the wait state. And so that's received by the module handler. A module has entered the state. What do I do in that context? Well, you start building. Uh, the process of building submits builds to Koji, and as each of those components, those RPMs finish building, they're routed through the consumer to the components handler, which says, this RPM finished successfully. Okay, remember that. This RPM failed. Okay, remember that. Oh, we can fail the module build. Right, and that, so that code lives in the components handler. It's about it's organized in response to the events that those are responsible for, and that's the that's the takeaway. Yeah, Adam. Uh, the arrow at the bottom of that box, like kind of going up the tags, is that significant to something about the process, or just where the diagram comes? Well, what are you talking about? Can you can you? So the arrow at the bottom, like it, 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 so at the top, it goes straight from consumer to modules, and then the other ones are kind of like twisty. And one very bottom goes to tag. I was curious if that's if, if that's significant in the way the process works, or just by virtue of the diagram. No, that's just by virtue of the diagram. It's, okay. not, it's not significant. It's just that there are different kinds of events coming out of Koji, and then the consumer makes determinations about which one goes where. Oh, I was just cool. trying to su suggest that there is routing involved. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And I was supposed to repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> is there significance to the curviness of the lines? And the answer was no. Um, check my time. A word about local builds, when you do an MBS local command on your own box, you can build modules locally using this local mock backend that we implemented. And the thing to take away here is that when you do that, it's not a separate piece of software, but you're actually firing up on your own machine the exact same software of the MBS scheduler that we run in infrastructure, just using a different builder backend. So that means that local builds are maybe a little more complex than they would need to be, but the benefit is that we have one piece of software we're sharing between those two environments, and so bug fixes you know, go to both. So this is a thing to be aware of if you get into MBS development. And that's it, I'm, I'm out of time here. Some things we need to work on. One was the question about doing smarter, more intelligent component reuse, and that's on our radar. Uh, there are other things like build time filtering and transit of depths when you say you depend, say your HTTPD and you depend on like an intermediary module, and it depends on platform. 
you unfortunately have to also specify that you depend on platform in your module at build time because the, the transitive runtime depth isn't respected in the MBS. Uh, but that is easy to fix and we understand how to do it. It's just a matter of cycles. You know, next couple weeks we'll bring that out. Um, transitive depths and build time filtering are both fall into that uh, context. Smarter component reuse is very tricky, right? but we, we, we know kind of what we need to do. Uh, and uh, context value and stream expansion, I don't have time to explain, but there's a, a, a email that was sent to Develist about a month ago that describes the, the problem and our, our approach to the solution there, if you want to put that up. Any, any questions for me specifically before I hand it off to Adam? No, Adam, it's yours. All right. Hey. talking about how do we do packaging in the modularity world and yeah I'll be basically talking about two uh, three main things like what is it to do packaging in modularity what to do and how we can do it so the first what it is so basically the main concept <coughs> of the modularity and this is just for recap is that we are transitioning from one normality distribution to a smaller pieces so instead of building like F20, F25 and F26, we can build independent modules and then just somehow merge them together. And this is a little bit more detailed picture. So you can see that in traditional Fedora, it's been sorted out by branch. So if I build, for example, web server with F25 branch, it goes into Fedora 25. If I build it from F26 branch, it goes to 26. This is pretty simple, but with modularity, we have arbitrary branching, and we have these modules, and we need to somehow decide what goes where. And that's why we have the module MD file that does many things, but it describes the modules and it's, that's like what goes there. And we can then reuse it if you want to build the final distribution. So this is like the whole, whole way from a package to a distribution, so I can say that I want to build, for example, a database module with a database package 2.0 and library 5.0, and I have a host and platform there, and I can say with another module MD, I want to build a Fedora Atomic Edition, for example, that's what they do, and they have some Atomic Platform host and maybe some kind of Atomic CLI. And that's how we can build a Build the distribution. Yeah, there is also is that like addition. Say LTS. Yeah, that's like <laughs> say LTS. So that's my example. Of, for example, my own spin. I can do my own spin host platform. There's spin on say LTS, for example. <laughs> because well, they stability at all costs. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> a dependency of <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. And there is also the concept that in modularity, one source builds many things. So when I have the module. This is a binary module. I can build containers, RPM packages, or in the future, maybe flat packs, and run them in several places, but it will come from the same source. So we will many things, but we fetch it on one place. If there is, for example, security issue, and it gets rebuilt everywhere. So that's one of the concepts we have. All right, so I said module MD. What is module MD? So I have many pictures. So yeah basically decides how to build a module, what to ship in a module, and it gives some hints how to use. 
So first, how to build. So I can decide what components go in there. So and this is done on the source level. So I can say package name and branch of each package I want to be present in the module. So for example, in HTTPD, I could add the HTTPD 2.4 uh, package or 2.6 package. Then I can decide the build order. And this is what Ralph talked about. So these are the build groups. That's also in module MD. And it also defines its build rules. So it's also something like Ralph already said. So I can say I depend on platform and some build dependency, like tech life, that's a very favorite one. <laughs> then I can decide what to ship. So this is the binary module. And I can see that some packages got built into two binaries. So for example, I have package two devel and package three extras. And I can decide that I want to ship the devel package. So I can use a feature called filter to get rid of one of the packages and just ship the rest. An example of that would be uh, stripping the X libraries out of uh, things like the system runtime. Oh, right. Yeah. That's can, you, can you repeat the example? Yeah, that, that was an example that, that could be used to stripping the X11 libraries. Because you might have a sub package that yeah. pulls them in. Right. Please don't filter sub packages. <laughs> I mean, you filter out carbons of the package, you don't filter out sub packages. Yeah, but there may be, for example, different modules with different use cases. So you want to have, like, for example, small container image. Yeah. You don't want to provide all of these packages. But yeah, that's up to you. Like, that there might be reason that there be profiles. Reasons. That'll be profiles, that's right. So profiles, yeah, how to use. So I have this package, that I sh uh, the module I have shipped with these four packages. And I can say that these two are API. That basically means that that's what I support. So if I have HTTPD module, I would have HTTPD package as my API. And if there are some dependencies, that's fine. But I don't guarantee anything about the dependencies. I guarantee only the HTTPD. And then we have something called profiles. And that helps users with the installation. So if I want to install a module on my system, I can either select the packages I want to get installed, or I can choose one of those install profiles that can help me. And there are many ways how to use them. So for example, if I have a database, I can have a server and client install profile. If I have a Vim, there could be normal Vim, minimal, or with HTTPD, there could be production and development. So there are many ways how to, how to use these. And that's what module MD basically. So it helps you to build the module. It helps you determine what to get shipped, and also how to use. One of the example I didn't I didn't say with the filter, with the example number two is, for example, if I want to bundle build dependency, I don't have to ship the build dependency. So yeah, that's also one of the things. Are there any questions so far about module MD? All right. So now what to do? So if I want to create a module, what, what should I do? So yeah, build the distro into easy steps, right? I need to build the modules, and I need to group them into distribution. That's pretty easy. So how to do the first step? I need to determine which packages go into module. And that might be easy. That might be tricky. And yeah, we had a question about like determining what's in every module so they don't overlap and they just like work with each other. So that's one of the problems we have to deal with. Then the module name, it might be easy, it might be tricky. For HTTPD, that's HTTPD. But there might be groups that needs to be sorted out. And also stream name. So for example, again, with HTTPD, there can be version. So HTTPD 2.4, HTTPD 2.6. But if I have something called like auto tools or lamp stack, how do I determine the version or the stream name? So that's one of the things we need to think about, I guess. So that's what I need to do. And these are, these are some links. So the first is our first attempt to deal with the dependencies and overlapping. It's basically a set of ugly shell scripts that just take care of it. Um, and yeah, if you wanna if you wanna do a 
the module name to access to this gate. So this is the package name space, this is the module name space, just this book and this gate. And we have the packaging guideline and the process here. And I'll share the slides so the links will be available. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's what we need to do to build the packages. And then there is this idea how to form the actual distribution. So what we are having now, for example, we want to ship the F27 server as a modular prototype, but who will decide what modules go in there? It's easy right now, just all of them, right? But we still have to list them. So there is a Fungi config we need to fill out. And yeah, we need to still decide who will own it and what to do. And there is a discussion after this where we can talk about it. But in the future, it could be in the way I had on the previous slide, and it's even the next slide. So I could just write a module on D file that would list all the modules I want to include as dependencies, and then you start in the Fungi config, just a single module. It will contain everything we need, even the SLA or end of life. So this is just an idea. Let's talk about it later. And I hope to do it. That's part of the workshop. So Tomasz in the back, he will have a workshop at 4. Yeah, so you're definitely welcome to come here and try this out. And that's all for me. Do you have any questions? Now, now you can ask questions of anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, what just is the meaning of life? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, the meaning of life? Sorry, I just <laughs> turned one year too old to tell you. Um, I was going to just make one quick comment. Uh, all that stuff that you saw linked, everything we talked about, everything else, is basically there. So, um, you know, start the, you know, if you want one URL to remember, that's the one. Um, go ahead, Mike. Can you just have a question about the filters? Um, in, the, <coughs> in the module of D, you're listing out the set of packages you want to pull in, right? So could you just not list the develop package in the module of D and have it not included? Or oh, so in the module of D, you list source RPM packages. Oh, OK. So yeah. You pull the right. right. I mean, you, you wouldn't list them in the API. So it would be, you'd right. say, you know, we're not asserting that this is guaranteed to be compatible. <laughs> But yes, the reason you would filter it out is if you were expressly trying to avoid pulling something that you didn't need. Like for example, you have a package that has a set of uh, plugins that it includes as sub packages, and maybe one of those plugins nobody uses but pulls in the entire uh, Emacs stack, for example. <laughs> if you don't need that, you filter it out. So the the problem I was referring to is that if you uh, you're making you're creating modules you expect other people on top of, and say you take, um, I don't know, you have some inspection and then filter out some of the sub-packages, then it's very hard to take that and add it back in uh, yeah, the filter, filter. filtering should really be done, uh, it would be an exceptional case. It really shouldn't be done unless there's a, uh, unless it's causing, it, unless it's preventing more problems that's causing. Well, and but right. there's the flip side of that too, which is that, you know, one of the problems <laughs> that we have today with the RPM world is that anything that is an RPM that's being built is assumed to be um, in good shape and stable and supported by the people who do it, right? What One of the things that you can do here, right, is you can say, no, I don't want you building stuff on top of this. Or you can, but you can only build it on top of these small set of pieces because I can't. Well, that's what the API says. Right, that's what the API says. Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of making the point that the, the flexibility here is also to allow to, to scope what people are going to depend on. And if you want to create a completely different scope, you are free to fork the original module. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or negotiate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 humans involved. Work together. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it may be that you end up splitting out that module into, uh, splitting out that package into a different module that's then yours and theirs we both depend on. Right, well. right, exactly. There's lots of different options. And I, and I really think with kind of like the Pagger on Diskit, you know, not without its problems, um, but the the real advantage of it is it kind of changes the mindset around collaboration on packaging in my mind, right? Is that, you know, it's very, very easy now to say, hey, it'd be really cool if you did this, and here's the patch to do it. Um, and then the, the receiver can decide to consume that. It's, I think that's much harder with Diskit, personally. Yeah, that way lies but so. <laughs> Everybody loves like so. Uh, more questions? Yeah.
when you install a module, what's what's happening? Then? Do you install every package that's included in the module, or just the API one and that pulls in its so dependencies? This is a this is a matter of contention. Um, okay. But so there's the the problem is that we use the term install with RPMs. Um, and what we actually mean is that at some prior point, I enabled a yum repo that allows me to install this RPM. But those two, those two steps are so far apart from each other, people don't realize that you have to do the one and to do the other. So to collapse that and make it so it's not as confusing with DNF, when you install a module, you're actually enabling the module and then actually installing some set of RPMs. That some set of RPMs is defined by the profile, the install profile. Yeah. Right. Um, well, no, not the API, yeah, sorry. The no. no, there's an actual thing that says, okay, here's the minimal, or here's the maximal, or here's the you know dev version, or the whatever. Right. And, and, there's, and there's a reserved word for default, which is if you don't specify one, this is what you get. Yeah. Right, which we, we have, have some it, problems with. With, yeah, with existing technology that can be referred as the um, install groups. Right, right. So the, the kicker though is, and the point I was kind of getting to in a long fashion, is that you can just enable the module by calling enable, um, so, and get no packages. And, or really what you will probably want to do, right, is you want to enable the module and then say, I want that one package and that one other package that has nothing to do with a normal install for whatever reason. We need to have a conversation about that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I can. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question. How much of Fedora's modules and whatnot can I leverage if I'm, say, running a third party package? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, in that context, you're building additional software on top of Fedora's base? Yeah. yeah. For instance, for the example of early guys earlier, what earlier was some sort of replacement for IUS. But knowing nothing about IUS personally, uh, I, would, I would guess that uh, presuming you were using the DNF tool that's module aware, you could build things still in the traditional way on top of the, 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 the repo of contact <coughs> and Fedora, and then in your build process enabling which models you want to depend against. So that would get you traditional RPMs on top of the modular base. If you wanted to additionally build your third party content as modules, you would probably need orchestration tools like the MDS uh, to intelligently interact with that. So you could do it on by hand, but it would be. So I mean, I think that the short answer is the same way you would today, with slightly more complexity. In that, you know, just like today, you need a way to actually build RPMs as your third-party RPM creator. <coughs> so, with modules, you also need a way to build modules. But there's not, there's no block or anything on you being able to pull that stuff as a base or whatever. Yeah, go ahead. So, how does this fit in? So we talk about this problem a lot. Um, so the question is kind of like, what is this related to like meta packages versus uh, comps groups? Um, so right there, we have a fight about that. Yeah, yeah. So we it's uh, modules kind of combine both in a sense, or they kind of look like both in kind of different ways. We have uh, some I think it was Radic who said like. Um, you know, modules are kind of like super groups, but at the same time, the install profiles are kind of like meta packages. Like Ava? What? Like Ava? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't get it. Super groups. Yes, like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I still have no idea. Um, but what about these? So, so the idea is that, I mean, so meta packages, um, you know, are kind of, a, you know, a way to try to accomplish the same kind of idea as like an install profile. So kind of some, some hint about how to actually get the software you need to run some, you know, to accomplish some goal. Uh, groups are kind of like the same thing, except in more of an eclectic sense. So like, um, you know, the, what was it, system tools, you know, set. It's like, here's a suggestion of what you need if you were gonna do system administration. So it, it's kind of like those, but kind of more fundamental. Um, so, but there's a lot of overlap with, and the way I argue it, and I'm sure the people who invented the other versions argue it the same way, is that I think modularity is trying to go after the root of the problem that there's a lot of symptomatic solutions for. So alternatives, infrastructure, software collections, meta packages, groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what modularity is trying to do is go after the actual problem rather than trying to just fix symptoms. But if, I bet if you ask them, they were saying the same thing, so. 
Mike again. Is the chain rebuild like model that modularity is kind of building on top of it? I mean, a lot more churn in the Fedora repos. Yes, maybe. Um, so the the thing, as I said at Flock last year, and or and maybe the year before, it's better. So modularity enables significant ability to shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, I don't think, as a Fedora community, we should shoot ourselves in the foot. But I'm just saying. I think so, we should all shoot Langdon. <laughs> That's how we should. Adam just wants to shoot Langdon. Shoot yourself in someone else's foot. So, so like, yeah, that, that, that would be a good. In, in the builder group stuff, if module packagers, if modulars, whoever they are, if they're not aware of how you can control that, then and if it's if it's done in a different way, then we will be rebuilding everything all the time. If we're going to have to go around and have conversations with it about like how do you how should you structure your model? Um, so that so you have the ability to do it in a way that rebuilds everything all the time, but we also have a way to limit it much more closely to rebuilding only exactly what we do today plus some delta. Um, so it's going to be somewhere between that and it's going to be more, but it's between a little bit more and like exponential. <laughs> so we're just going to have to watch it and keep track of it and restructure the content as we identify problems. But this is this is what guidelines and processes are for, not not enabling technology. You know. But I did, I mean, I was kind of curious about, I'm looking at how, at how frequently glibc has been rebuilt, and I presume almost everything will inherit, I assume glibc is in hosted platforms. And thing, almost everything is going to inherit from hosting platforms. Well, one thing is that there are currently no chain rebuilds in the between modules. Right. So uh, platform rebuilds, everything in platform rebuilds basically new glibc. Oh, okay, so right. it doesn't but cascade from... Yeah. I mean, it's not this time. Right. Right. So the, yeah. the question of chaining rebuilds between modules and casket, if one platform gets revved, then do we rebuild every other module? Is a question we're actively investigating right now. Yeah. And we had good discussions about it last week. We can tell you on the details, but we, we came up with, uh, I think it was seven scenarios in which we might want to trigger a rebuild, and we're looking at each one as its own policy question about whether we want to pursue it, because they will need increased cost, but how much do we want to do it? But one, one of the, the simple options is just whitelist platform for blacklist platform. Every, everything else rebuilds, but not that. <coughs> well, you can say, right, if the load gets high, we just see chain rebuilds within modules, saying this is a uh, built package that doesn't require a rebuild independence. Yeah. yeah, and then how do you choose which modules do or don't? Well, the, the important ones, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just keep waving those hands. Exactly. If you're, if you're interested in that question, to gave with Jan Kaluja, who's, who's heading up the Fresh Maker project, and that would be responsible. Is this going to kill RPMs? Like, is this going to replace <laughs> packages? Uh, yes. Certainly not anytime soon. Yeah, certainly not anytime soon. So for F27, workstation is going to be produced without modules having any impact on what's going on. So, and F28 is still an open question. And even then, if everything was fully modularized, it's like the, the session after this is called When to Go Fully Modular. And it would try to get on that question. Yeah. I'm thinking about it. Um, <laughs> for that, you said, I mean, all of these models are made up of RPM, so RPM doesn't get displaced by this. This builds on top of RPM, so so that's like the no. Okay. Well, at those second and third backends. Yeah. <laughs> so, so where is Alien fit in? Yeah, that? Okay. That it's that it's more a question of what replaces <laughs> the uh, traditional whole repository metadata information associated with particular release or spin. So let's say Fedora 30 goes fully modular. Thanks. Does it provide DNF or YAM compatible metadata so that plain YAM or DNF can fetch that? That would be a question to answer, not that uh, RPM right. is there, no. So at present, yes, that's the goal. Um, the problem a little bit is just um, you won't see, you basically won't see a bunch of the new stuff, right? Um, and, you know, and so how can you solve for that? So some of the, you know, we've actually toyed around the idea of um, kind of generating um, what I refer to as name mangled versions of the things so that they still are available and they're out there. Um, and to basically kind of accomplish that, so, so you know, some old DNF yum could still work with it just Well, fine. the thing is that addition or spin defines exactly what goes in it, mm -hmm. right? So at that point, from the YAM or DNF point of view, it's just a bunch of RPMs mm -hmm. exactly defined in the spin. Right. So for that one, you generate a metadata that YAM or DNF understand, 
and they only understand that spin. Right. Exactly so like we do now. Right. So you're not losing anything with that. Of course, you're not getting the flexibility to generate spins, but if you're only consuming a spin, mm -hmm. that's you, if, you, if that's your point, your software continue to work. Right. So and, the, that's the, the and that's exactly right. The, the only thing is just you also need to ensure that your repository doesn't have two different versions of things. Exactly. So like uh, that, that example has like database 1.0 and database 2.0 in the same yeah. right in the same spin. So, so in that, that means case, available. You, you that just means available. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but you need to you need a way to say if I install database, I want yeah. database from database 1.0. Yeah. Let's right. say it's a right. profile within a spin. Effectively. Yeah. Right. Let's see, yeah. So there will be something called system profile that will decide for a, for an addition or a spin what is the default. And if it's well, but no, if you but yeah. your scenario, what I would actually do is like if we really get get to this module and D definition of the kind of uh, output artifact in a sense, you know, basically you would just blacklist all the things that were other versions, right? Yeah. So that your which is not a default, which is not a default profile. Right. Or you generate wrapper data per profile and let people choose exact uh, URL to, to point to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have, I mean, we have a lot of options. I yeah. mean, I guess the, you know, but the, the short answer is basically, you know, um, as I wrote in the blog post about the Voltron release, right, is like the idea here is not a greenfield, right? We're not building a brand new thing. We're trying to build a new feature set on top of a bunch of things that we have. Yeah. Um, so I kind of refer to it as we're kind of turning it on its side. We're not okay. deleting it and starting over. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. We have we have two minutes left formally in this but session. We have like whole hour for discussion. So that's yeah. Should or should not hurt. Should I start camp or campaigning now to get more disk space for my Fedora mirror? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, that, the answer to that was yes, even like that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a side effect of all this work, yeah. But again, it's a, it's a policy decision, right? I mean, <coughs> again, you, we can shoot ourselves in the foot um, and have, you know, 50 million different versions of everything that's out there, or we could be sane and have maybe two for some things, um, you know, but for the bulk of it, actually only have one. Because it's a volunteer community, we're not going to be able to maintain you know, every version of everything that ever existed. Um, so, and I don't know why we want to, but you know, during the transition period between Rails 3 and Rails 4, instead of saying, no, you can't upgrade, we could support both for a while. Right? I, I imagine it's gonna be also mainly focused on popularity of the project, right? So like, you know, we might have four different Python versions, but like, you know, only have one, I don't know, PHP. One pearl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wounded. I, there's there's a, the practical aspect of it is that I imagine we have a number of leaf packages in our 53,000 you know, package set that if they don't make their way into a module for Fedora 27 server, they won't actually be a part of Fedora 27 server. It's a Fedora 28. Like, there might, we might have an opportunity to call some packages that are, have been abandoned for years and nobody knows that the maintainer has actually left but we're still just rebuilding them and shipping them over and over. Well, and, and the flip of that too is like, do we really need more than one version or less? You know, like. <laughs> less is <laughs> much. <laughs> What's the API <laughs> compatibility guarantees of less? Do we have legal obligations <laughs> over how long we have to provide compatibility for it's guaranteed and the source code and stuff like that? <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah, so retention right. policies. I mean, but again, it's just policy, right? Like yeah. the other thing that's tied to the closest is the licensing. No. Like GPR, GPRs, specific requirements, depending on the terms. Yeah, hold on a minute. Um, no, I meant policy as in we just have to set a policy that we will retain those things for the appropriate amount of time based on the rules we're supposed to follow. Right? I mean, it doesn't really have a particularly strong technical impact. Yeah, and that, at least coming from SRP on these rules. Right. <coughs> All right, Matt, now it's your turn. Okay. Uh, if any module is a library that is not in a shared underlying module, but it can be built in the module separately, then that module can built and built, that library can built in build service with a different name to those modules, right? I, I didn't actually follow the question. Yeah, I'm not sorry. sorry. If, yeah. ten, if 10 modules include, include lib, 
something or something or other, which would be built ten, ten times the different NDRs? Yes. It would obviously make things bigger. So this is in the conversation they're about detecting overlap. And that's the use case for how we do that. Yeah. yeah. Right picture that we had in that library mm -hmm. would become its own module mm -hmm. for part of some underlying shared module. And I think this team's been exploring different ways to structure that, and it continues to be confusing. But we're not sure about it. Presumably in the build service too. If it's okay, the we are out of time for this one. But this, the next session is just. Yes. All right, yes. so let me just close it out for the video. Yeah. Um, thanks everybody for coming. That's uh, that's the wrap for this part of the talk.